Okie dokie. Good morning. Welcome back. Tuesday, College Talk Summer Series, waiting for our participants to enter, or attendees, I should say. Right. I know I've got them registered. So now we're just going to wait for these numbers to change. Okay. Do you see anything on your end? I don't. I see two participants. That's, that's you and me. That's you and me. Right. All right. Let me, this is not what I was expecting this morning. <laughs> All right, we'll give it a minute or so. Sure. Let's see. Let's do this. Remember, we're going to do the same thing where we ask them questions and have them. Yeah. Come back in. <laughs> if we get any attendees in here <laughs> the thing the the thing is i think um people know that they're getting the recording right and so there's this uh false sense of oh i don't have to be there because i know i'm gonna right. get the recording. oh here comes someone there we go we've got one attendee shauna's in right now waiting for others so i know that um the as i said the recording is sent to the attendees after so sometimes um they know that there can be a late entry or right. if they can't make it happen then they will um register so that they know that they can get the recording and then it'll get sent to them right so we'll wait a few more minutes and hopefully get um a few more of the registrants to be live rather than waiting for the recording right and then we'll get we'll get going so um I guess we can just go ahead and start. We can start and as they roll in, we'll just go from there. Does that sound like a plan, Paul? Sure, sounds great to me. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna introduce Paul this morning. Welcome back to Tuesday's College Talk Summer Series. Um, as you know, that today is um, the piece that is focused on um, the mental health of students during these college, during just not just college admissions, but just education in general and how that is affecting students um, and families with the uncertainty of what it looks like. Um, once again, not just in the college application process or college, but just high school in general, each high school is doing things differently, teachers, schools, administrators across the board. And so all this change. And so we're, um, you know, we had two weeks ago, we addressed it with the students and today this is focused for the parents and um, how they can best support their, their child slash student um, with um, all of this change and uncertainty that they're, they're having. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Paul. Paul Royer is a licensed clinical social worker with a private practice in Pasadena, California. He's been providing individual and family therapy in the area for the past 25 years. Um, Paul completed his undergraduate degree from Cornell University and his master's in social work at San Diego State University. Upon moving to the San Gabriel Valley, he was the clinical director of the Youth Services Program at Los Encinas Hospital. And Paul has worked with many of the schools in the Southern California area, providing parental support groups and student evaluations. He specializes in helping families deal with substance use problems, communication problems, and acting out teen behavior. Um, so um, I know Paul personally, I asked him to join us on um, this, uh, my college talk series, because um, he presented at the various schools that I've worked at in the past and worked with the students and families in that area. And I thought this would be a great piece to add into um, my college talk series um, 
along with the admissions reps that are um, presenting. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and switch to the next slide so we can talk about the topics that we are going to cover today. So um, I'm gonna let Paul take it from here. Thank you very much, Nagla. Um, so what I usually like to do is, is to sort of have us, let us have a little bit of an open dialogue where we're able to communicate back and forth and to ask questions. Um, it looks like we've got only a few people here, so it's going to be a little bit challenging, but hopefully we'll be able to do the best we can to, to talk about this, this difficult subject. So getting us started, um, what I'd like to do, first of all, is to ask you to sort of do a quick reflection on what you see going on with your teenager. What are my teenagers major strength areas? What are my areas of concern? How do I feel about them as they are working on trying to be more independent? So uh, I, if you can use the Q&A box, um, so you should have a little um, text box and use the Q&A and go ahead and put them in there and then we'll be able mm -hmm. to see those questions and we'll answer them um, in there. I know that there is a chat box also. And um, last time we had both things going. If we, yeah. could keep it all, if we could keep it all into the Q&A box, that would be great. <laughs> Sounds all good. Right. All right. So um, we need you to participate in order for us to um, have this um, engagement in the discussion. So we'll wait. Um, and well, why don't we just hear who's here today? Why don't you just tell us um, who you are and um, what your student, what year your student is in. So best way to motivate, so there's a question. What's the best way to motivate a student? Ah, that makes a lot of sense. So that's a great question. And what we've got to try to do then is, is to understand what type of things do tend to work with my child. What are, are they the type that require a high level of structure? Or are they the type that um, are generally more independent and just sit down and do the tasks on their own? So I think that before we can, you know, actually answer that question that you have to sort of look at what type of a child you have, because very oftentimes, the answer will be a little bit different depending upon what kind of a kid you got. So do you have a self-starter or do you have a someone who needs a lot of external reinforcement? <laughs> okay. All right. Well, what's in that? You're, you're kind of jumping ahead here, but no question. You know, the first thing that we're working on is really that accurate assessment of what type of a kid do I have? Do I have the child who, you know, is very, very social and loves to be out there and talking with other kids? Or do I have the kid who wants to be isolated and at home on the computer all the time? So as we sort of take a step back and stop seeing our, our own children as, oh my gosh, this is, this is, my, this is my child, we're going to step back and just say this is a child and what's going on with them? So what I think we have to try to do then is, is to look at the child that you're most concerned about and try to understand what are the things that I've done historically to get this child motivated. So what have you done historically? Ah, money for grades. Money for grades, so bribery. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I remember that deal that my husband actually cut with one of my boys. Money for grades, it was $20 per A or $25 per A, something like that. So if they got A's in all their classes, um, you know, six classes or whatever, they were making over a hundred bucks. Right. Just for doing what they were supposed to be doing anyway. 
Exactly. If we kind of had that conversation. Is this really the best way to motivate them? But you know, it gave them it gave them the that incentive to want to do it. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I have a love hate relationship with that money for grades thing. We. I'm not. I. I'm. I'm going to admit we did it. So. Right. Um. <laughs> well, and once again, I. I think that it speaks to the struggle that most of us have as our kids get older, meaning that, and let's sort of put this into a, a broad context. <laughs> money for grades does not work. That's very, very <laughs> accurate. No? Meaning that when our kids are younger, they depend on us. They depend on us to be directing them, giving them guidance. And some of us, you know, what's again, there, there's a lot of variables. There's our own personality as parents. There's how many kids we have totally. Do we have one child? Do we have six children? So there's a lot of little variables that impact how we interface with our kids when, we're, when they're younger. But at some point in time, 12, 13, 14, as you're moving at the end of middle school and into high school, we've got to be able to shift gears with them. We've got to try to teach them how to be internally motivated. Because if it's all just about grades and it's all just about making cash, I mean, that will, like I said, that'll work for some kids at some times, but it's unsustainable because at some point in time, they have to value it themselves. So that does require us as parents to sort of shift grades and come up with what we call higher level strategies, things that interventions that we're going to do with your oldest, it sounds like here, to try to help them to realize that they're doing this for themselves, not just to please you or to make some cash. So, so turn I, it into something intrinsic rather than extrinsic. So yes. it's, I'm doing this because I want to do it because I see a future for myself and whatever that is, whether it be grades or sports or, or, you know, whatever aspect, I feel like they have to want it for themselves. Otherwise down the road, it's, it's all going to be, done or have had been done for somebody else and not themselves. Right. And it sounds like with your younger, you're saying that you um, not had to motivate in the same way, more independent, stronger grades, but struggles. And once again, what I'm hearing from you is, is, is that it's a very, very common challenge in a lot of homes, which is we've got different kids who require different structural levels. And that puts a lot of pressure on us as parents. And so I love that we are sort of bring opening up this dialogue here, which is, is that we've got to understand not just what's going on with our child, which we're going to keep talking about here today, but we also have to really kind of understand ourselves. So this gives us a really good opportunity as adults and as parents to look at what were my parents like? How did my parents motivate or not motivate me? How did my parents communicate? How did my parents structure the home? Because what we're going to find is, for most of us, we either look back at our parents with starry eyes and go like, oh my gosh, my parents were the greatest thing in the world, and, and they raised me perfectly, and I'm going to do everything that they did, because that's going to work with my kids. Or, oftentimes, it's the very opposite oh my God, my parents were the worst. They were inconsistent. They yelled all the time. And I'm never going to do that to my kids. So what we end up with is usually as parents, we don't really think about this. And that's one of the main problems. So that's why I'm so glad that we're having this dialogue here today, which is, is that I need to not just be winging it. I need to actually have a strategy for what I'm going to do with my children to communicate with them, to motivate them, and to try to do it better than my parents did with me in, in whatever that means. So let me ask a different question of you here. Would you say that you are a very, very structured, demanding, high level expectation parent, or are you a little bit further on the other side where you kind of let your children figure it out on their own? That's a good question.
I know what my children would say about me. <laughs> <laughs> I was highly, highly structured. Exactly. exactly. So. All right. Anyone? There we go. All right, so we got one, one person chiming in here. Uh, both, you're both things. Uh, demanding in terms of expectations. School is their job, but relaxed in other areas. Okay, that, 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 well, that sounds like a perfect parent. <laughs> 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 Set the expectations, um, but then have the, the variable of, you know, being, you know, what's the word? Not, re not, I don't want to use the word relax, although she did, but you know, being right. understanding, that sounds like being understanding in other areas, he or she, it just says anonymous. So I'm not sure. <laughs> right. But not according to your kids. Yeah. Good point. Very good point. But I, I think that that's the other thing is, is, is that this would be a really great opportunity for each of us to go back to our children and even, you know, throw us under the bus here today. Say, hey, you know, I was sitting here on this webinar thingy and this guy was asking me all these questions about what kind of a parent I am. And ask your kids how they perceive it. Because one of the things that is so vital and I'm sure you're already aware of is, is that as they get older, our opinion, we can ramrod it down their throat. We can make them at certain times do the things that we want them to do. But as they get older, we have much less control over what they're doing. The best example, of course, is the, um, you know, we ask them what they did with their friends on the weekend. It is possible that they went out and they spent time with their friends and they were playing basketball and they were staying out of trouble and nothing was going on. And that may be what they tell you. It's also possible that they're at the park smoking pot and selling drugs. You're not there monitoring them 24 seven. And that is back to that concept of how we parent and how we create a relationship with our children so that they're able to talk to us about the things that are really going on with them. Do my kids lie to me? Do they tell me the truth? So finding a way to get them motivated sort of gives us a little step over back to relationship. How am I as a parent and do I feel like my kids come to me to talk about the concerns that they have in their life? So you feel like your kids come and talk to you a lot? I know that mine did not talk to me Actually, I take that back. I had one who spoke too much, <laughs> told me more than I needed to know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and I had the other one who was much more reserved. Right. But right. I have, I now have two adult children. Right. Um, and they are not the same two people that I had as uh, teenagers. And I think it had to do with the fact that I took your advice, Paul, when you spoke um, and changed the way that I communicated with them when they were at that really critical age of, like you said, I want them to be telling me the truth and making sure that everything is, um, you know, that they know that they can come to me, no matter how great or how bad it is, that they know right. that they can come to me. Um, and now I have that, um, now I have that relationship with both of them um, about, every aspect which is which is amazing and great um well and then, once again I'm, I'm so happy to hear you say that because i think it really kind of speaks to as we're talking about sort of these progressions we can look at our relationship with our kids like i said when they're in seventh and eighth grade and then we look at them as they're moving into high school and they've got access to cars and parties and all those kind of things and then of course the next step as we're kind of alluding to here today is getting them ready to go off and be independent in another city, another state, wherever that may be, right, where right. we talk to them, you know, intermittently. And so then let me ask a, a more reflective question. When we're talking with our kids, are we asking them what 
they see going on in their lives or are we kind of telling them what we want them to do with their lives? Interesting. And I see that here. It says, you know, I talk to my kids a lot. And then the other portion of that says, I know um, more than I should sometimes. Um, so, you know, is that communication as Paul just stated, is it what, um, you know, what you are wanting to see, or is it really truly about what it is that's going on in their lives, their trials and, and struggles and, 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 you know, whatnot in their life that's going right. on. So uh, we put it out there in the form of sort of a qu broader question for everybody to really kind of reflect on, which is, is that back to what we talked about in the very beginning, do I have that child who is super social and wants to go out there and is meeting people? Now, the upside of that is that they learn how to have friends and how to manage themselves in social situations. The challenge, of course, then is, is there's a lot of exposure, booze, pot pills, sexual situations. So we've got to, once again, not just look at our kids and look at them sort of as that entity that revolves around us, how we motivate them for their academics. We've got to take a much broader perspective on our kids and say like, hey, what are the areas where I feel like my kid's doing a really good job with these situations? And what are the areas where I'm concerned about my kids? So we'll put it out there in that way. Do you have a child who is extremely social or who tends to be a little bit more isolative? So it looks like I know that I have some um, other independent counselors who registered and maybe possibly a few school counselors that registered. Um, so I see a question coming in. I think it's not coming in from the parent perspective per se. It's right. saying, so how do you get a student who is not my child, um, who is not doing well in school, motivated to do better? or to set their sights on looking at that college future? Well, I, I, well, well, I would just go over to that question and that, that's fine. Okay. But, well, once, once again, I, I think that it, a lot of it speaks to um, what is the structural needs of the independent child. Some children really, really require a lot of structure and expectation and we have to try to help them put their structure together. Other kids are much, much more able to be flexible and to sort of navigate their world. Um, so the structure piece is one of the main variables that helps a child develop a quick sense of positive feedback about having successes. I needed to get my homework done, so I sat down from four to five and I finished my homework and it's done, yay me, now I get to go goof off. So that structural piece is a huge component to it. The other piece is the emotional piece, meaning that a lot of kids get very, very stressed and overwhelmed um, about how they're doing with their performance in school. Some kids are very, very sensitive to things that are going on in their peer groups or stresses that are going on in their families. So, the other piece to the motivation, not just from the structural answer, but is also to start jumping over into emotional awareness. We've got to be able to have a good relationship with the teenager or the young adult so that they're able to feel comfortable enough to talk to us about whatever is going on. If they're in a difficult, challenging relationship, uh, the parents are getting a divorce, um, you know, the family's worried about finances, all of these little things can have an impact on a child's ability to um, be comfortable and successful. I, I know that I've seen working with my students just recently, Paul, um, right. just over the past couple months with schools, you know, literally shutting down overnight, you know, they were at school on Friday and then there was an email sent out and then there was no, that was like, that's it, we're not coming back. And then everything kind of was in limbo. And I will say the schools that had something uh, an established plan, like a backup plan anyway, whatever that, that may have been a contingent plan for other reasons. Right. They transitioned well into that remote learning. The students were like, okay, I know what I need to do. This is where my assignments are. This is how mm -hmm. I do it. And it was, it wasn't a, a, a shell shock to the system. 
the and then I had students in other schools that didn't have that. They right. didn't have a plan in place, and it was just you know basically every teacher doing it a different way, and and the school not having an overall arching plan, and those students were falling apart at the seams. Right. Um, so when you talk about structure, I I see what you're saying there is like. I, I think personally, being in education all these years and then also with my own children, I think all students, and children in general, thrive with structure, period. Right. Right. So when there's structure there and you give them what that is and they know what their expectations are or what your expectations are or the expectations of the class or the system or whatever the case may be, um, they know, they know what they need to do. And then the decision is theirs of whether or not they're going to do it. And right. I feel like when you start to see that the decision making maybe is not the best or is not like you say, they're not going in the direction of being motivated to do better, then, then you can start talking about what, well, what is it now? The structure is laid out. We know what it is. So what are the other aspects then that are not making it happen? Right. And address those emotional pieces, like you're saying. Well, and what's getting going back to that, that final question there, which is how do we help these kids set their sights on on being as successful as they possibly can? You know, I, I think that, you know, the emotional piece is something that just gets lost very often times because you will oftentimes have a kid who's very, very capable of doing the work, but there's a an emotional variable that's in the way. Maybe, like I said, maybe it's a family stressor, maybe it's a lack of self-confidence. But for all of us as adults, you know, those are the little bridges that we always try to help these kids learn how to navigate. Now, I do want to really kind of talk about this, this COVID thing because I do think that it's, it's not going to go away. And I think that we're going to just continue to see more and more confusion and stress from the institutions, from the students themselves, um, you know, for, for example, which schools take SATs and ACTs and which don't anymore? I mean, it, it's, it's just accessing accurate information, I think, is not just stressful for the kids, but it's also stressful for us as parents to watch them go through this. Absolutely. So, that was the whole reason why I put this together. It initially started as what does test optional mean? And then it rolled into this whole college talks thing is because I'm getting the universities coming on on a weekly basis to tell me what are, tell, not only me, but all my participants and parents and students, but what, what is your school doing? And what is the policy change that you have administered for the class of 2021 and beyond? Some are doing it for 2022, 23. They're taking three year, you know, experimentations here with regards to test optional. And what does that really mean at your school? Because some are saying test optional for admission, but not for merit aid. So if I need if I need financial aid or you know merit aid, and I know I can qualify it for it, but I can't go sit for an exam because there isn't one to take in my area. Right, right. How does that affect me? And so how how are you going to how are your policies going to change? And that's stressful today the announcement just this morning, I got an email from ACT, um, they announced all of their um, test sites that were canceled for the month of July. Across the board, New Jersey, Massachusetts, California, Florida, you name it, they canceled them. Right. So right. here are these students and parents who have spent money on test prep, right? Who have spent hours and hours of study time and now it's canceled. Now what? Right. And I know it. I know my students are stressed out. Right. Well, and once again, going back, another great question here. How, how can, we're obviously aware that this COVID thing is causing a lot of anxiety and, and uncertainty for everyone, but what can we do to provide stability and structure? And, and I think the, the big key is exactly what we're doing right now, which is acknowledgement. We need to be able to look these 16, 17, 18 year old kids in the face and say, you're right, this is confusing. It's gotta be validating for us as competent professionals to lean into this and say, we don't have all the answers right now, but we're gonna keep working on it with you so that they don't feel like they're just kind of hung out to dry and they, they're, 
don't have any awareness of, of who to go to to even get any relevant information. Okay. And like I said, the other the other piece to it for all of us as adults is is backing back to assessing that child's strengths and weaknesses, stability needs. Because there are some kids who are a little bit more confident, they're on it, they're on top of their game, and they really kind of know what's going on. And so they don't have any problem coming to adults and asking questions and doing those kind of things. There are these other groups of kids who are very, very shy or unsure or not exactly know how to go to adults to talk about these things. So we've got to make sure that we're aware of all the different kids that are sort of in our realm that we might be needing to uh, reach out to. I will say one thing, um, as much as I hate to give this as an answer, um, I've had students and, and parents come to me and I'm the professional and they come to me and they, they hire me outside of um, their, their, their school and to work with their students and they ask me questions and I have to use the three words, I don't know. Right. And it's, I don't know because the schools don't know. The admissions people on the college side don't know. They haven't established their policies. So um, with regards to, you know, how do we provide them with that stability or structure? Um, I'll tell you what I'm doing with my students. I am moving along the application process and the college admissions process as I normally would to give them that, that this part as much as these outside factors are changing, let's focus on the factors that I, we can control and work on those. Right. Because I can't, I can't fix or change or make a decision for what the colleges are going to do. So providing them with that structure and stability and the process that I use, um, that hasn't changed. Right. And so I think if you're in a, uh, you know, if you're a school counselor, it looks like here, or if you're another independent counselor, um, you know, what is the normal process for your rising seniors? What, you know, what do they normally do when they come back in August? What's the normal process? You work on that normal process with them and give them that structure and that stability that they know, uh, you know, what it, they, they know it's coming, right? This is what we normally do in August. We start working on our essays or, you know, we, we do this, that, or the other thing and give them that, that normalcy as much as possible. All that being said, I want us to also really kind of pay attention to the other sort of glaring um, challenge that is going to be faced by all these kids. So let's just be hopeful and optimistic that a large percentage of them are going to get to take that next step towards independence and into adulthood and be able to be on campus. We've got one year with these kids. And it's a special challenge for us now because not only do we have to deal with talking to them about safety and COVID and masks and I, I, like we just said a minute ago, we don't even know how universities are going to try to, how high schools and or universities are going to navigate all that. But that's definitely a huge discussion that we're going to have to have with our kids. But it also really forces us to challenge ourselves as competent adults. Have I been spending my time over the last couple years truly getting to know and understand where my child is at with the challenges of adulthood? What is my kid's thoughts on drinking? What have I taught my kid about drinking, binge drinking? What have I taught my kid about pot? Are we the family that just, okay, well, you know, pot's normal, it's legal, so everybody just smokes pot? Or are we the super rigid family who says absolutely no to any of that stuff? How have we had discussions and dialogues with our kids about relationships and sexual activity? Not just from a, a, from a plumbing stance or from a health stance, but if we started talking to our kids about emotions and relationships and how that is going to affect them. How, what type of dialogues have we had with our kids around consent and around date rape types of situations, particularly when you're talking about drinking and 
I mean, I'm sure everybody even saw that in the last week, you know, DeVos put out that um, there's m trying to push back towards um, having men have more due process and rights. And uh, you know, I'm sure everybody's got varied views on that, mm -hmm. but that's something that's actively going on in the college campus world and needs to be something we talk to our kids about. If you got a male child, well, what, what does consent mean? If you've got a female child, then what does that mean? And how do you, what has been done historically to talk about sexual behavior and what's appropriate and what's not? And then we, another one, of course, is just the entire spectrum of heterosexual versus bisexual versus homosexual thoughts and feelings. Their kids are all going to have a lot more exposure to all these types of things. Maybe this is something we talk about in our family all the time. Maybe we've never even broached the subject. So point being here is, is that as we are preparing our kids to take this next big step, we got to start talking to them. Another big piece um, and you, you covered a lot of big ones. So, you know, we could be talking from now until the end of the year just on those. Yeah, exactly. um, <laughs> but another big... Well, we got an hour, girl. Come on. <laughs> the other big one is finances. Sure. You know, how do you manage that? You know, we, we're, we've got a budget. This is what the budget is. This is what it looks like. Um, how are they going to contribute to those finances? Are they, are they not? Right. You know, I see that one is a big discussion that comes with... Um, with you know families also so um but that you know that's taking us to that point that I, we have on there with regards to um transitioning from being a parent to a partner in, mm -hmm. in education so um so I, i'm not going to interrupt again let you go <laughs> no 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 again but i would put that out there and once again i'm not sure exactly who we've got here still interfacing with us so but let me put it out in that form of a question which is is that what have we done within the last 12 to 18 months to open up a dialogue with our kid about any or all of those subjects? Is that something we've been doing a lot of or communicating about, or are we just getting super fixated on grades? That, that I will have to agree with you. Sometimes that, that those pieces are lost because we are so fixated and worried about the academic piece that we lose the other pieces. Sure. Well, and once again, we have to remember the school on the whole is relatively predictable. There's a, there's a teacher slash professor up there who's going to give assignments and have expectations. And generally, it's pretty consistent. And our kids either learn how to lean into or push back against that level of structure. My experience has been, and, and you know, we can, of course, keep this open and would put it out to everybody else who's out there, is, is that it's the emotional variables that determine the success or the failure of the child. If the child has learned how to be social, then they will continue to be social in school. If they've had to deal with a lot of these challenges around different cultures or different experiences or social situations, including substances, then the child has a frame of reference where they're able to know how to navigate those things. If your kid's never gone to a high school party and they get into, I don't know, USC, and SC is going to have, you know, football games and frat parties, and they've never been to anything like that, don't know anything about that, that is going to be a shocker when they hit campus. So it's our job as the parents and as the adults in their lives to start talking to them about the realities of these things. So can you rephrase the question again? Um, oh, think the question would be, what have we been doing in the last 12 to 18 months to open up a dialogue with my child slash young adult in my world to start talking about these experiences? Okay. Personally, I have had those conversations with all my kids. Six. You go. You go, <laughs> I still have some of those types of guys. Well, once again, I love that you're, you're putting it out there, um, that it's, 
it's always a challenge, even as they get older. Sometimes they get older, it's even more challenging because then they want to know more about us. Uh, agree completely. The one question I toss out there, which is, is that how are we doing in our conversations as far as asking them questions versus telling them what we think? That's usually where we struggle. I'm not, I don't know about anybody who's, who's online right now, but that's generally where people or us as parents have a hard time. We look at our kids and say, hey, you know, I don't like you drinking and I don't want to see any of that going on here in my house. Good conversation, thinks a lot. And then we walk away going like, all right, yeah, I got that, nailed it. No, not really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and once again, that was one of the cornerstones that I was really emphasizing with the kids last week, um, that as they get older, their communication needs from us is also very different, and that they have some ownership of trying to engage with the important adults in their lives. So if they are having a hard time with feeling super anxious or stressed or overwhelmed or they're concerned about, you know, any of the things that go on in high school that get these kids stressed out. Oh, my, my girlfriend's going to break up with me or my best friend has got an eating disorder, or I'm worried about, you know, if I don't get into this school, my parents are going to be upset with me. You know, there's all these things that are going on in our kids' heads. And that's where we've got to start, start asking them questions and not just telling them what we think. And you did, I remember you asking that, do you have somebody to go to when those, those, those levels of stress start to rise? If it's not your parents, is there a trusted individual in your life, an adult that you can go to, to help you answer those questions and navigate through that? Um, and I'll have, and I remember they, you know, you asked that and they were typing in, they were, and they were throwing out names. They were like, Noah, Alicia, <laughs> right, you know, they, right, were, they were right. saying names of, you know, these are the people that I can go to. Um, so, I mean, that's positive, but sure. as you know, we stated before, we also want them to come to us as parents or as the trusted adult in their life. Um, you know, for the main basic reason is that we have more experience than their peers do. So and once again, that's why our, our relationship with them is so vital because they can, they can go on the internet and of course you can go on the internet and you could find affirmation of anything. Right. You know, I, I had literally will have kids here in my office who are telling me that it's, it's good to do little bits of LSD every once in a while because it's good for your brain. I'm like, <laughs> are you out of your gourd? Um, so the internet's not very reliable. Oftentimes our friends have got their own agendas. So for us to be able to have that relationship with them is really, really important. And for us to not overstep in that, because I love this next question here about, you know, how difficult it is today, even with all this other stuff about Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter and microaggressions and how people struggle to, uh, you know, us as adults are struggling to know how to listen to and communicate with one another. Absolutely. Um, it's definitely a lear learning experience for our kids. And, and once again, that goes back to where we started here today with that assessment. Maybe I've got a kid who is really out there and active and is engaged in all this stuff and is, a, is educating themselves and, and out on the front lines. Or maybe I've got a kid that I can't even get off the computer to get out of the house. So each of those kids is gonna require sort of a different type of intervention strategy. And I love that, that you're asking about what are the best types of questions. And, you know, I, I think that- I like that know, question too. Tell me what to ask. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, once again, it comes back to that relationship that you've got with your kid. Hopefully over many, many years, we've been building up to this point where we're able to say to our kids like, hey, what are your thoughts and feelings about what's going on with the Black Lives Matter? And hopefully your child is in that place where they're comfortable enough to let us know where, open up to us and talk to us about how they're really feeling. Um, or it's also possible that maybe for whatever reason, we haven't done a great job with that. And so what we've got to do is to go back 
and really start with just some simple trust issues like, hey, you know, we haven't been talking that much and I know you're getting ready to go off to college and I just, you know, let's get use today's experience as the opportunity to say, I just really want to know what's going on in your head. What, what do you think about all this stuff? And just hopefully they'll bite. And if they don't bite the first time, that's okay. It's just like fishing. You're not going to catch a fish the first time you throw your hook in the water. So sometimes you've got to throw it in and then give it a day and then come back to it and then come back to it. Because eventually they're going to realize that you're just interested. And hopefully we haven't been too much of the lecturing parent because that's usually what really turns the kids off is when you say, I want to know what you think. And then they, as soon as they start talking about what they think or feel, then we go, yeah, I'm glad you think that, but you're wrong. Let me tell you what I really know. Yeah. That's kind of a relationship killer. So one of the things we've got to really do is sort of put our own ego and opinions on the side and be able to just start really trying to see what they think is going on with their friends, with the world. I mean, are they, we didn't touch on, there's so many other variables here. What about climate change? Is it real or is it all a hoax? You know, and just getting there so we can start having more open discussion with our kids. I know that I'll just speak from experience. The one, portion of their lives that they tried to keep behind closed doors was the relationships that they had. Right. So right. I always had to talk about things that would eventually lead me there, but it would start off with not necessarily climate change. Cause I know if I asked that question, they would, they would both look at me like, what are you doing? What's wrong with you today? Right. Um, right. So, but you know, a question that then would lead into, so starting off with something non-threatening, to get them to start talking um, and then it would you know slowly lead into a conversation about relation about their relationship that, that they had with that significant other at the time so um, that was something that I learned the hard way because um, you know I would I would just dive right in so you know what's going on with you know so and so and they you know they didn't want to have that conversation with me that, it's just, <laughs> that was not that I was not the person um, so, you know, with regards to, you know, what do you recommend you start with? Um, you know, what do you think, Paul? Give like two. Well, let's give it, for as difficult as the world is today, it is, if nothing else, incredibly opinionated, meaning that people really, really think that their, their opinion is the right one. And generally, people have a lot of strong views about things. So, on one sense, that's kind of a challenge because we'd all, we all feel like we want to get our kids to agree with us. But we also have to remember and be insightful enough to go that sometimes it's not our job to make them feel or do anything. It's for them to figure it out. So if we ask questions with any of the topics of the day, whether that's, so what do you think about the president? What do you think about just happened with the... Um, abortion thing that got shot down yesterday. What do you yeah. think? I mean, what we always have to remember is, is that when we come to these young adults and are really genuinely asking what they think, that's an ego boost for them. Oh my gosh, somebody really cares about my thoughts and opinions. Now, once again, that's where we got to be a little bit careful too, because as soon as they tell us something and maybe it's not exactly what we want to hear, that can cause a little bit of a challenge. Well, there's, there's a question for you right there based on that. So to your comment about keeping ego and opinions aside and listen, what if a child is voicing something wrong, like taking acid every once in a while is good? Um, how does a parent not lecture but express what is right? Well, I think that that's when you have to try to, you have to try to go to where'd you get that information? Well, you know, help me understand because I'm hopefully assuming that that's probably not the norm in the family. <laughs> we have to go back and say, hey, where are you getting your information? What's your thoughts about all this? And let's get, if, if we're still having a hard time with um, being able to come to some resolution, like, yeah, if your child thinks, you know, I, I want to be a white supremacist and then today I'm going to go and, and join the KKK. Okay, well, we should probably have some concerns about that also. So I do think that you know, if you are noticing some huge red flags about things that are concerning to you, 
then that might also be the time to seek out some professional help to try to help your kid, you know, open up and, and have a little bit more awareness. Because if your kid is going off and is knee deep in the drug world, I can only tell you what I see over and over and over and over again, kids who have drug problems in high school just tend to have bigger drug problems in college. And that generally is not a really good, um, a really good um, use of your resources. Absolutely. So um, I, you know, I'll pipe in on the, how to, you know, how does a parent not lecture, but express what is right. Um, I taught science for years. And so, in, and, and my husband's a physician. So whenever they would come to us with something, I'd always ask for data. So where did, where did you get that? Where'd you get that information? And, and, you know, are, is there anything there that supports that this is really truly okay to do whatever it may be, you know, whether, whether it was drugs or drinking or, or sexual activity or whatever. And they would then start to tell me where this information came from. And that helped with, like you said, the dialogue um, of opening and speaking. And then they would come to their own conclusion half the time that what they were saying didn't make any sense. Right. So that, that usually helped. And I, once again, the, there's so many, so many things going on in our world right now. And, and once again, I, I, the, the one that comes up most frequently here in, in my office is, is the one about pot use and how, you know, there's, a, there's more, more data out there on the internet that says that, oh, you know, pot's, pot's better than opiates. Yeah, there's some truth to that. There's some truth to that. And that, you know, pot's not really a problem. But, you know, there's also a lot of data out there that really talks about how in the young developing brain, it has a huge negative impact, particularly if there's any type of predisposition towards depression or anxiety. So going back to Negla's point, which is, is that we can oftentimes just get the discussion started and start trying to have more dialogue with our kids because when they go off to college, like I said before, we're not gonna be there to tell them what to do. They're either gonna be there making their own choices. And I think that that's also part of the discussion that we have to really work on trying to have with them is, is that you know, you're getting older and I can't tell you, I can't make you do things a certain way, but the decisions you make are definitely going to have consequences. Cause that's really the thing that's gotten lost in all this is, is that, Yes. There, there's a real disconnect, you know, people want to call it entitled or, or yeah. I don't think these kids are entitled. I think that we haven't allowed them to experience enough consequences of their natural behaviors. So there's a little bit of a disconnect um, for what they do and then how that's going to, how the world's going to react to them for that. So. I, I agree with you on that one, that sometimes there is the, the lack of the, the natural natural consequences for um, for behaviors for whatever reason you know there you know that whether it was something that happened at school and the consequences were you know not equal to the the offense or due to the parents or or you know maybe that they maybe there there were no consequences that maybe they got away with whatever it is what they did and there right. was no consequence right so there's all kinds of reasons as to why that those two th things don't always um, connect. So, all right. Um, so I think we've answered all of these questions that have um, come up in um, the q and I'm going to go back and just click on them. So we've got them off here and um, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you go ahead and go on to where you want to go, Paul, unless we have any more um, questions here. Well, the, the one thing is that I really want us to do as parents is to feel like we've we have a strategy, like we know what it, we're trying to do. And I think it, just to reflect on all the things we've tried to kind of cover here, which is, is that the, the most important piece is that assessment of my kid. How old is my kid? What, what is my kid good at? What are they not good at? What am I worried about? So that we can try to really understand, you know, if my kid's a, about to be a senior, getting ready for them to go off to college. So I feel like I've got some time to work with them on whatever areas that they need to get better at. And the other thing that I really want to emphasize for all of us is 
really making time to talk to our kids. Now, I've been talking to parents about this for the last two months. And so I think it's fantastic that we're realizing that if, if there's anything good from this COVID thing, it has forced us to be around our family a lot more. And hopefully we're maximizing that time. We're really spending it with our kids, with our family, with our significant others and trying to say like, how are we doing? What's going on in your world? What, are, what do you see happening here? What are your thoughts, ideas, and opinions? Because like I alluded to earlier, that's, that's what really is going to help our kids feel confident as they move into this next step. And if we have big concerns, I really want us to work on trying to reach out to get other supports. Because that's the other thing that's been really, really difficult here as we think about what school is going to, high school is going to look like and, and what college is going to look like. Now, there's a concern about, you know, who do I go to ask these questions? So I do want us as adults to make sure we're staying very connected. Anybody who hears in this world has obviously got a lot of support. Would encourage you to continue to utilize that. So, all right, we're just coming up on our hour, if my clock is right here. So any Both other big questions that people six. wanted to throw out? Anyone? Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, you say that, my husband was like, telling my son the other day have you ever seen that movie and he said no and he's like oh, oh we need to watch that okay, but sorry <laughs> missed the question oh no just as were there any other areas that um you what are the topics or ideas that you wanted to bring up that maybe we didn't touch on here today that we could spend a couple minutes on um before we wrap up No. Nope. Perfect. <laughs> All right. That's awesome. I, I, I will say it again. Um, this is a very, very, very broad topic. And this is usually one that's like at least a four hour discussion. So we did try to cram a whole lot of stuff in about communication, conflict resolution, emotional assessment of our kids. How ready are they to go away to college? There's a ton of information we tried to throw out there today. Please know, you know, I've said this to the kids last time and said to Negla that, you know, she's going to put my phone number and, yes. and email stuff out there. So if there's anything, uh, questions that come up over the time, you can always feel free to call me or, um, or email me and I'll do the best I can to try to get back to you. Absolutely. So uh, both our contact information is on the screen now for um, those that are interested. Um, so, you know, what I do with the students in the college application process is um, to reduce the amount of stress um, that is involved on that one aspect of with regards to the application process. So, you know, working with them, getting them started early, um, keeping them on task and, um, you know, providing that support uh, to, you know, get them through that process without um, adding one more stressor to it. So as we all know, the application process is not what it was when we went to college. Right. Uh, so they're, they, they're, it's much more demanding and um, of what these um, institutions and the applications are asking of our, of our children and our students. Um, and this, you know, this year and the following year is not only is it much more, but it's much different. Um, we don't know what each school wants. So, um, you know, working on things earlier, keeping organized and, you know, time management and working on pieces of the application that you can get to before school starts um, is what I do with my students so that we can utilize the summer in order to, you know, get the best bang for your buck with, you know, going back to school and managing your, your first semester of senior year, right? You've got AP classes, this, that, and the other thing. You don't know if you're going to be remote or online or some hybrid um, situation of what school's going to look like. So once again, 
to reduce all of those stressors that we were talking about today um, is, you know, what I do in, in, in my work with the students. And obviously, Paul is, um, you know, working in a different capacity because he's working much more on that emotional piece that comes along with that. So I, you know, I don't touch the emotional piece. I'm not licensed to do so. Um, um, I do, um, I know when I see my students are starting to like, well, okay, this is not okay. This is beyond the normal stress level. And that's when I'll reach out to parents and, and let them know, you know what, this is more than um, just an application thing or just a college thing. Um, you might want to, you know, have a conversation with your child or possibly reach out um, to a professional to to seek to seek that, but I you know that's a piece that I don't touch because um, well, I'm not so I'm not qualified to do so. One more quick thought on that though, Negla, because I love what you just said, which is is that you know some kids even though they're incredibly smart and capable are not emotionally ready to handle all the um, requirements and expectations of living independently. You yes, know, whether uh, like I said, whether it's relationship stuff, social stuff, academic pressures. Um, and so if your kid is not ready, it's okay. Love community college. It's there for a great reason to give Absolutely. kids the opportunity to mature and to figure some things out. So there's a wide range of options. That's absolutely true. Um, and you know, here where we are, Paul, on the on the Central Coast, um, we have a great community college here, Cuesta. I don't yeah. know if you've heard of it or not. Yeah. Um, yep. And so, you know, they they get their their students to universities all over all over the country. So, yeah. um, it, it's great. All right. So we are at the hour. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up, unless there's any other questions. Um, don't forget starting. So next week we are off July 7th. It was the 4th of July weekend. And I just didn't know if it would be a good idea to schedule one the Tuesday following 4th of July. So starting on July 14th, all the way to September 8th, we have some of them are actually more than three universities because I got so much, um, I got such a great overwhelming response from the universities because there are no college fairs happening this fall. And there's the possibility that there will be no college rep visits, actually not possibility. Everyone that I've spoken to thus far, they are not um, going to be traveling to um, high school campuses. Um, so I have some of the, the dates between July 14th and September 8th have actually four and five universities on um, for the presentation. So, um, so uh, don't forget to register for those. Um, all of the questions with regards to the academic piece, with regards to SAT, ACT, test optional, GPAs, um, opening and you know what that will look like for the class of 2021. Um, you know some schools are even starting to discuss whether or not a COVID-19 vaccine, if it's available, if it's going to be mandatory or not in order for you to attend school. Um, so that's another thing. Those are questions that are coming up. So <laughs> Paul just put his hands up and said, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> um, so those are the questions to be asking those reps when we are um, on uh, discussing with them. And they, are, they have all been forthcoming and open about what their institutions are doing. And um, it's a great opportunity for the students to engage with their actual regional reps that would be reading their applications. So um, please register and um, have your um, students and child do so. And um, we'll see you um, in a week from now actually a week two weeks from now on the 14th all right thank you have a great bye. day bye oh one more question oh thank you thank, <laughs> thank you <laughs> great talking to you